Hello and welcome to the Flucoma podcast. Today I'm talking with Professor Nicola Hein, who is a sound artist, guitarist, composer and scholar currently based at the University of Lübeck in Germany. So Nicola's creative work spans a wide range of forms and practices, uh, from sound installations to AI-driven interactive music systems, from augmented guitar to intermedia works using video art, light, dance and literature. We shall be learning about his creative process, his approach to instrument design, and some of his thoughts around aesthetics and musicking. So Nicola, hello, and thank you so much for talking with me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jacob. It's a great pleasure to be here. Quite welcome. Um, so perhaps you could begin by telling us how you got into the world of music. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I started uh, out playing piano as a child. Actually, because my brother started getting piano lessons and I was jealous. I was like, okay, if he's getting piano lessons, I'm getting piano lessons. There's no way... <laughs> I'm not going to get piano lessons. So, um, yeah, I, I got into piano playing as a child, and then I started to play the electric guitar when I was uh, 15, I think. And, um, yeah, I don't know, quite quickly I went from the world of, like, heavy metal, well, as you would do, right, in that age uh, group at that time, uh, th um, through jazz and to like improvised music and uh, more abstract sorts of things. And um, yeah, I guess uh, quite quickly I felt like very comfortable in this, let's say, avant-garde scene. And I started uh, also doing uh, sound installations or doing circuit bending, uh, programming uh, simple things back then. Um, and pre playing prepared guitar and and i think sort of the uh, yeah some, something about the preparing the guitar and uh this sort of like search for extended palettes of of sound uh, has definitely been uh an important part of my practice ever since and uh i think that also um the the work that i do in in electronic music is very much uh I don't know. It's very connected to my uh, practice of of improvised music and to that whole sort of like yeah, also a social milieu of people that that do that and the whole uh, international group of people that engage with it. Yeah. So we can thank your brother then for for getting you into the world. Yeah. Yeah. But I, <laughs> yeah, I have a brother as well, and I certainly know that kind of thing of where yeah, if he was doing something, then. I had to do it as well and yeah yeah, yeah that's some, that's something i certainly understand yeah um so you're yeah, talking about so became a musician so we both stuck with it yeah An interesting back and forth sort of project <laughs> yeah. or process yeah oh, it's good to hear yeah. um so yeah so you're talking about electric guitar there which is obviously going to be um an important part of your practice which uh, i certainly want to get into um a bit later uh, but first, um, sort of get an, uh, a general idea of your practice. Um, so you've described your work as being um, driven by the interaction of sound and space, light, movement, thought, and the becoming of embodied and intermedial intelligence in aesthetic systems, community, and technology. So obviously there's quite a lot to unpack in that statement, but um, I wonder if you could break some of it down and sort of generally describe how you see your work at a macroscopic level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I, I, how to say, I think a lot of my uh, work is um, centered around the idea of defining systems for a limited amount of time. That can be intermedial systems, um, not necessarily all the time, but definitely a lot of it. Um, and um, define sort of, let's say, uh, rules of how those systems develop. And I mean, those rules can be defined for like example by um, programming um, uh, or by bringing together different kinds of, of people um, that have their own sets of behaviors. So in, in a sense, like uh, now if I think about 
cooperative systems between uh, like uh, human and machine agents, I, I think uh, both um, exhibit different kinds of behavior or bring in different sorts of, let's say, layers in, into a system. And I'm, I'm really interested in, in defining those systems and um, let's say, uh, try and see what happens in those systems with different kinds of feedback processes. And now these feedback processes, of course, they can be uh, uh, human to human, they can be human machine, they can be good old microphone, loudspeaker feedback processes. I think that there are a lot of different kinds of layers uh, of feedback processes that are relevant for these systems for uh, to develop. Um, and also, for example, in my uh, uh, in the v uh, work that I do with video, which is definitely also quite a bit, so real-time performances with musicians and uh, video artists. Um, I think defining systems uh, also by developing concepts uh, for uh, space, uh, for example, with like multi-channel audio and like multi-channel video projections in space is, is quite relevant. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and in defining those systems, I'm very interested to, uh, I don't know, uh, to keep a lot of freedom for those uh, systems to develop as they do in performance or in installations, um, but definitely look at things from this sort of, let's say, systems perspective. Mm. Um, and Well, you could say it's a, a somewhat of a cybernetic lens, maybe, to look at things. And uh, um, uh, certainly, um, Doing this, I, I think you can, uh, I don't know, also probably think about the, the agency uh, from like mechanical tools to like software agents to human performers to uh, specific instruments. I don't know. All of those different things have agencies in, in, in a system and I think, uh, or have agency within a system. And I think that's sort of like what I'm trying to get at with that statement is that uh, I'm, I'm really interested in developing different kinds of systems hmm. yeah. and uh yeah and uh, recently definitely over the last yeah several years i've i've been very interested in in developing systems which we will talk about later that deal with non-human musical agents on also non-human uh, uh like video uh, agents that work in collaboration with with human agents yeah no definitely we'll get we'll get back to that um notably talking about some some specific projects that you've been working on um just before that it's just um so yeah you talk about defining systems and just made me think back to the last episode of the podcast with um with jess aslan um she who she defines a lot of her work as algorithmic composition and i that's a term that i couldn't didn't really come across in in your work i wonder if is 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 that a term that you would associate with your work or or is is that something um a bit different that's a very interesting question uh i mean of course the term algorithmic composition has been around for a long time i sort of tend to not identify or use it too much to describe what i'm doing although i i think if you wanted to you could certainly um apply it to parts of it. Um, I, I think it would remain a question uh, if that can be applied to, to everything, since if we talk about algorithmic uh, composition, you would, for example, not uh, talk about things that are not computed as algorithmic. I mean, maybe you could, but that would be a little bit of a stretch, I, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah 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 well no i think um yeah to get into into the kind of meat of the things um and really understand your creative process i think it'd be great to talk about some specific projects that you you've worked on um so i think a good place to begin would be uh with tertiary pretensions uh which is a solo project that you describe at, uh describe sorry as developing a software agent that is capable of learning the human musicians musical gestures and idioms in real time so i'd love to hear more about this project and perhaps also get a kind of snapshot of of how it works under the hood as well mm -hmm. um yeah so this uh uh project um 
uh, is based on the idea um, that, well, mm, let's say, I, I think there is a lot of nuances in how, uh, like in, yeah, uh, forms of, of music that are somewhat related to jazz historically or in, in their own conception, um, the sort of like nuances of players of like how they perform, of how they form a sound uh, is a very important and central element to like how we identify persons sonically or how identity is created um, as a sort of sonic persona. I mean, you can think of, I don't know, someone like Thelonious Monk. Probably it takes you two or three notes to know who's playing the piano. And um, I think that uh, this uh, sort of like forming recognizability and uh, in a sense also um, yeah, creating a sonic persona through uh, patterns of sound and like how people behave with them or how they act with them is really relevant still in like fairly abstract forms of improvised music or at least I tend to see a very clear line to 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 the jazz history. Well, of course, on the other hand, I full well know that there has been quite a discourse also in the improvised music scene from the 60s on about like how how do we deal with the jazz legacy and how do we uh, maybe also position ourselves towards that in like a European setting. So, however, so I I, I feel very comfortable identifying what I do in with this term that George Lewis coined Afrological Musical Practices. And um, so in a sense now uh, here, what I'm uh, doing with um, this uh, project is to see like, okay, what happens if I use um, machine agents to train on the vocabulary of like actually human performers to sort of walk their own way with that and make that part of the, or maybe the central element of, of the musical um, of the musical project. Um, what happens here in the in in the project is that I'm uh, recording uh, as I'm playing. I also do projects with like pre-trained uh, material, but uh, uh, in this specific project, usually when I start playing. The virtual agent knows nothing. It's it's an empty buffer. And um, now what it does uh, is uh, to perform an MFCC and a KNN analysis, which I mean, Flucoma also offers that uh, these sorts of options um, to uh, then um, basically, let's say, uh, use different kinds of feedback processes um, to form a behavior out of out of this so um what it does is that it records uh, audio and it uh, does an mfcc and a knn analysis and then it tries to match incoming audio to the material that is already in the buffer it has different forms of behavior of how it can relate to it but roughly speaking uh you have a feedback chain between incoming audio streams and the sort of audio material which is already known uh, by the machine and um, I I think it's very interesting to see that uh, in a in a sense uh, the the space and the sound of the space and um, really using re uh, using a microphone uh, and the sort of like ne necessarily incorrect sort of interpretation that you have because uh, so the material that is recorded when I play is line in. So now if I have a microphone that is recording what's on loudspeakers, I have the space, I have the sound of the loudspeakers, I have the sound of the microphone. And of course, to the MFCC analysis that is also performed on the incoming audio, that's a huge difference, right? I mean, I, I could, or you could, any human could hear uh, the sound and say like, oh yeah, it's it's the same musical material, but uh, to that form of uh, music information retrieval process, 
it is something different, but still it is related. But I, I would claim that in a certain sense, the difference is larger. And, and that's an interesting sort of like problem that arises in, in the process. And I'm sort of working with um, uh, mixing different microphone uh, inputs and different uh, inputs also from my guitar to, yeah, let's say also bring forth different kinds of relations that it that it forms to its own like musical corpus. And uh, usually then the, the virtual agent as it performs, it will listen to itself and it will also to me play or sometimes it will only listen to me. Sometimes it doesn't listen to me at all and only listens to itself. There are different sorts of modes that all lead to different forms of behavior. Um, yeah. But here again, uh, as I was saying before, I'm, I'm very interested in like how those different kinds of like feedback loops that you can form and the different qualities that these feedback loops have um, sort of bring forth uh, quite a different sets of musical behavior. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I mean, yeah, and so obviously that, that you, you can approach some things like um, differences of microphones and direct lines in with things like filtering and stuff, but there will always be, yeah, some kind of some specific difference. But it's it's interesting to hear how you kind of take those technical limitations and and kind of navigate them in a in an aesthetic way. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, you, you mm. talked about um, spatialization uh, there. So, so in this project and across many of your projects, you you do seem to place quite an important role on on multi channel uh, multi channel diffusion and spatialization. So, I, was, I wonder if you could perhaps talk more about your approach to spatialization. Um, absolutely. But before I do that, maybe I should still because I I thought that question would still come, so I saved it for later. The yeah. term tertiary potentials. Yes, so Bernard uh, Stiegler. Yeah, the term that comes from Bernard Stiegler, and um, uh, what uh, Stiegler uh, takes this term from from Husserl, uh, where Husserl distinguishes between retentions and protentions, um, as yeah, uh, as a conception of time within consciousness, and of course also Husserl distinguishes between like. Uh, primary, secondary, and then uh, with him not so much, but still like a tertiary protensions and retentions. And to Stiegler, uh, these tertiary protensions actually mostly he identifies either with social media or with money. Um, they have a somewhat, let's say, archival function. So um, uh, for, for Stiegler, you have the primary protensions and retentions, which are pretty much synonymous to or are used in the same way as with Husserl. Um, with the uh, uh, secondary uh, retentions and protensions, he thinks about uh, memory and then tertiaries are the archive. Um, and those can be digital archives. And so his argument uh, is that um, uh, the conceptions of future are very much determined by our uh, digital archives uh, or by archives in general, but for him, it focuses on, on digital archives. And so in a, in a sense, I, to, to me, my reading is that Stiegler has a, let's, let's say, concept of those archives where the individual agent becomes a little bit passive towards these archives. So the argument is to say like, you're already embedded within a conceptual framework in which basically your choices are quite limited. And uh, I, I think in a sense, like in in, um, in improvised music or in, in any sorts of like art that tries to challenge how we deal with media also to a certain extent or how we deal with the world, uh, I, I think there is an interest in forming an active relationship also to um, digital archives, to digital technologies, and also how we about like our engagement with technology. And uh, so here, since with protensions, we talk about the conception of future, I'm very interested to see like how in this process of, of improvisation between like several agents, we are always the concept the conception of future is quite a quite a rele relevant aspect to the process of of improvisation because 
you're not just making sound, you're trying to compose sound in time and you're trying to lead it to certain directions. It's going somewhere. It's not just happening without like going anywhere. I think that oftentimes, at least to me, that's maybe not forms of improvisation that I would look for. And um, it's very interesting to see for me in this process how like over time, because right when I start playing, the agent doesn't know anything. And as you keep on playing, it actually knows more and more and more. And uh, over time, for me, when I'm on stage and performing this, I feel like, okay, we are developing a sense of like musical direction together. It's going somewhere. And uh, that's, a, that's a process that oftentimes I think also performing with you musicians, especially if you don't know each other so much yet before you start performing, you're sort of trying to figure out how do things develop? How do musical forms come about? And uh, and I think uh, for me, that's a very special process to do with a machine learning agent that trains on my playing, which, I mean, that's quite close, obviously, to what I do. And oftentimes, I think for the audience, it can be hard to discern, like, which one is the virtual and which one is the uh, human uh, guitar player there, uh, how still in this process i find an attunement with the, the system that totally still changes how i would behave and how you know together you conceptualize what those musical futures would be and how they're composed hmm. um however, so that's uh, that's the stiegler reference yeah so. no no but it, i i'm glad we we came back on that because it, it, it is really interesting so talking about this this kind of feedback process again that seems to be uh, an important recurrent th theme in your work um, yeah no it's it is really interesting i i, I knew stiegler for um his concept of grammatization but um mm -hmm. but yeah no when i saw i saw that reference it was really interesting especially as um at the moment on the current research projects i'm working on with it's we're working on digital archives and 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 you know but let, that's you know quite specifically digital archiving and of, of media and and how to approach that and how to navigate digital archives as well and so yeah no it was a, it was a really interesting thing that uh yeah um i i wanted to hear about yeah <laughs> it's a very interesting text by a philosopher yuk hoi uh, from hong kong who uh, worked with stiegler very closely where he's reflecting about the the, this concept of tertiary pretensions and its uh, sort of like genesis as well, like a, a contemporary critique of it, let's say. Mm. Um, I, I can tell you the title later. Maybe that yeah. could be interesting. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, well, I'll put it down uh, as with the, the other things that we'll talk about today. Uh, I'll put it in the, in the list of links that will be living under this video. So, yeah, no, that would be really interesting to hear. Yeah. um yeah cool uh but so yeah so uh getting back to the project of tertiary pretensions and the kind of uh the mechanics of it um yeah if you wanted to talk about uh the the spatialization mm -hmm. in it and your and your approach to spatialization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um so specialization oftentimes in these projects um i try to find ways to basically make them musical gestures specialize themselves with like let's say different patterns but i i think oftentimes i i have an interest in like let's say using uh different spectral analysis uh algorithms to basically determine movement in space so that i can uh perform a gesture and it will specialize itself because well the spectral change uh, uh shape of it is, is changing all the time so in a sense then you create specific locations in space you could say for for specific like spectral shapes mm -hmm. it is definitely different of course that's also a common uh, approach that is around from let's say uh you have a spe specific frequency band that appears on a specific speaker while another part of the frequency band uh, happens on another speaker i mean for example the GIM specializations tools, right? They offer stuff like that, and it's definitely a common approach. Um, but this is, is different. Um, 
because I'm wherever the sound appears in space, you will still hear it full spectrum. Yeah. Uh, but really, depending on on yeah what the spectral components are, it will appear somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the position is determined from from a spectral shape analysis of uh, of, of the yeah. Air. Yeah. That's a really interesting approach. Um, and so now, if for example, in this um, tertiary potentials uh, project, um, uh, um, actually the the, the uh, virtual agent has two different kinds of voices. Sometimes they play at the same time. Sometimes they perform uh, uh, like alone. Uh, and me as well. So you have basically three voices, and all of them have their individual specialization. Um, which definitely to me, I also think uh, it really helps the sort of like acoustic discernibility quite quite a bit um, when you have it on a multi-channel system versus uh, stereo or mono. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a... I think that, um, yep, uh, and I think to, to, to fill uh, on on that, I think partly that approach also comes out of, let's say, the problem that as a guitar player, I want to be able to have my sound specialized but I need my hands. I, I cannot um, use my hands so much. And actually, I started developing this approach um, uh, because I was working with uh, Axel Donner quite a bit uh, from Berlin, who has this yeah, quite quite uh, amazing setup that he developed for, for his trumpet, where uh, he has a controller on the trumpet uh, built by uh, Tsukanda Podalika. Um, who is a, also um, a builder and a guitarist and a sound artist from Berlin, uh, who has been building incredible stuff for many, many years. And actually a lot of pieces that you see around uh, have, have uh, Tsukanda doing part of the work somewhere down the way. He's a very influential person. And um, he uh, developed this trumpet controller. And so Axel really developed a whole, like, a language out of that which is really unique obviously with his sonic language already but then the what this trumpet uh, quadraphonic project became and uh, so for me in like playing with Axel the interesting thing was always to see him do the specialization with the controller and I was like well I guess it's not going to work for me because I really need both of my hands to produce the sound that I do and uh, so over time I, I, I started to think that uh, maybe, uh, let's say, actually use the sound as a controller might be more efficient if I actually uh, need my, my hands to to create the music. Mm. No, it's, it's really interesting to hear. So, uh, yeah, the agency of your instrument, the guitar, um, in, imparting its agency within the development of the software and and how it influences that and yeah so i, I was going to say so it so it's a solo project um and even though at the beginning of of a performance um the rolling buffer will be empty and and the machine agent doesn't know anything about what you're going to be putting into the system um to what extent would you, would you say that um this is really a personal project that, um, despite sort of starting from nothing when you're performing with it, um, obviously when you're developing the software, um, it's, there's going to be things that, as you just demonstrated, are, are kind of, um, pushing the system towards your style of play and your, the, the, the mm. uh, your instrument. Um, guys, I'm, uh, would it make sense for this system to be, to be played with another instrument, with another performer? Um, yeah. um, I mean, I, I have done, uh, definitely uh, things like that uh, as well. So like have other people play with that system and, uh, it's very, uh, um, interesting for me to sort of observe also how other people are playing with that. And in some sense, like observe the agency of listening that you have in those kinds of systems. And um, oftentimes I feel like, uh, let's say the challenge for the human musician in doing those things is really uh, the, the kind of listening 
that you do and like how how empathetic are you with a with a machine in order to develop a flow that makes sense mm -hmm. and um i uh, yeah I, i definitely find that the way that one listens to a, to a system as sort of like the basis of the performance is very um uh yeah it's a absolutely relevant and like uh central part of it um so actually uh, so the um how to say um i i think about you know in a sense like you you, you could say there is a human uh, listening involved there's a machine listening involved um but i think uh, also about the listening of the resulting system right so uh thinking of this uh phrase uh um Is it uh, structurally cu coupled and functionally no functionally closed? Yes, um, is um, of course like a neo cybernetic uh, phrase that um, describes uh, um, yeah also the let's say the bounding of of different kinds of systems and I think that happens in in listening very much and you have a sort of like a resulting kind of listening which i actually call cybernetic listening um of the human machine system so the human machine system will also have uh as a system have a a, a kind of listening that is sort of like uh very central to like how the system runs and how for example the feedback flows within that system Mm. And I, I, I think, like, um, also, uh, I don't know, at least to me, when I perform with, with those things, I, I try to really watch out, like, for, like, how is the whole system sort of listening to itself? Um, because I'm obviously not alone in this, and in a, in a sense, uh, mm -hmm. as an agent. And I think it's very interesting to sort of observe how the whole system then starts to listen. Mm. Um, and yeah definitely in working with other musicians with this it's uh, it's very interesting to observe this from the outside mm. um no it is really, really interesting. interesting yeah go go oh, thank you <laughs> um and i'm actually also gonna uh, speak about this like differences of listening a little bit more when we talk about uh this the project with viola yip uh, later yes yeah no transonic yeah no it's uh Look at well, well. We could we could talk about um, transonic uh, projects right now. Um, yeah, I think that'd be yeah. really interesting. Um, yeah, well, so to sort of give people a um, kind of idea about the project, you might not know it. So, um, uh, so it's based on this idea of of light as musical material. Um, with uh with viola yip as you said um so obviously i was able to watch some videos on youtube but um i can imagine that um a video recording as with many of your pieces which place a lot of uh importance on spatialization and as a lot of improvised music um video recordings that don't place you in the place can really kind of pale in comparison to actually being there um but yeah so the piece reminded me of some work by Olivia Pasquet um who worked on the Flucoma project who works a lot um with light um but yeah I'd, I'd love to hear more about the piece and how it works mm -hmm. yeah um and so uh, this piece it's actually we, uh, um uh, it's a project between a, a sound artist composer uh, Viola Yip who um, built uh, her own instruments as a very important part of her practice. And um, she actually performed a new piece of hers with a feedback dress recently in Huddersfield. Um, and so this piece is based up on like her um, light bulb instrument, which is called Bubble, and uh, me playing guitar and partly also Buchla synthesizer in this project. And um, We, with this project, we were very interested in, um, let's say, uh, finding modes of uh, really uh, understanding the kind of music that we do versus, yeah, let's say, intermediate music. Um, 
That's also a bit related to this idea of like non cochlear sound or non cochlear sound art, non cochlear music discussion that probably you are familiar with that happened in um, in connection to René Duchamp's uh, non retinal art and was like really brought up by Seth Kim, Kim Cohen um, and has found some reception. Um, and uh, I, I think now in this setting, it's definitely very interesting to see like how does the uh, visual information that the lights provide how does that really act as a yeah as a as a musical agent you could say or how does it work musically what kind of music does it provide and um so in this uh, piece um viola yip is playing her uh, light bulb instrument with a self-built light controller it's a capacitive a controller that makes it possible to play like different uh, settings of the light bulbs, play them in different speeds, uh, generate different patterns. But it's really, really a live instrument, which is meant to be played as such as an instrument that is also fairly, fairly analog. And um, uh, yeah, in, in playing uh, with this um, piece, Usually, uh, we um, also work with a multi-channel sound system, and uh, actually, uh, oftentimes, also use the sort of like this uh, um, the, the virtual agent that I would use in my solo performances to actually train this. On the one hand, on on my guitar playing, and on the other hand, uh, on the uh, musical material that is generated by the light bulbs and of course if you use either the same or different uh, um, memories it's very interesting to see what happens um, again here now coming back to the concept of listening um, because it is very interesting what sort of like how do you construct listening to light it's not so uh you know it's it's not an easy question or there is no easy answer um what we are uh, doing in this case is actually to work with solar panels so it's like small five-fold solar panels which you can use as microphones um so of course uh here it's really that and we have, I mean, we have done different pieces in which we use solar panels as microphones. Um, but in this piece, for example, if we had a solar panel at one position in space, depending on uh, the, the distance to, uh, to the solar panel and the angle, you really get uh, quite different sorts of like uh, pitch material from, from the light bulbs or uh, different volumes. Um, and you can sort of, create a uh, by no means objective but definitely interesting sort of angle on on, on what is happening and um, we also use this material so for example there are stretches uh, in uh, usually in these performances where for example uh, you will have a solo uh, of the of the light and I'm, I'm not performing but um, actually the light is also recorded with a solar panel and it goes through the whole chain of my guitar pedals so the, the sound that it, it, you have on the one hand, you have the clicking of relay switches, which are used as oscillators and recorded with a usually with a shotgun microphone. And on the other hand, uh, you have the solar panel sound that is, um, or the sound of the light bulbs that is recorded with a solar panel or yeah, of the light. Um, and then going through the whole guitar pedal chain where it really gets pumped up or sometimes I also apply like different kinds of like stutter delays or stuff to it. Um, and uh, uh, now these sounds are specialized as well. And um, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I will also use uh, these uh, kinds of incoming lights to, for example, control the Buchla, which has a MIDI connections. I don't know. It, it gets quite a, a complicated system that has a lot of different layers because then you have you have me playing guitar you have uh, the light bulbs uh, that are in space uh, you have the sound of the light bulbs of the relays in space you have the solar panel 
sound, you have a virtual agent trained on the guitar, virtual agent trained on the light bulbs, and you have the bookla on top. So the whole thing becomes quite, quite like complicated. But that's very interesting to see that mm -hmm. what what can happen within uh, such a system um, in in as like different different agents shift within that. Mm. Um, no, it's, and so it, now, um, uh, 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 sorry. No, no, it's <laughs> sorry, right. Continue. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, uh, usually, um, what we have also done with this uh, project is to either have whole sections or actually whole performances where I'm not playing guitar anymore. So I'm not even on stage. So it's really, uh, and that's where the offline training comes in. So you have a virtual agent that is trained on me playing guitar and bukla. And um, well, it's a duel between Viola Yip and the virtual version of myself. And um, of course, here again, uh, like uh, let's say you have a corpus of guitar recordings, and it gets all these like inputs from like solar panels or also room mics. There's no way it can really match it properly, obviously. Uh, but that's exactly where sort of the um, uh, yeah where for me the interesting part starts. So uh, in in a sense, like uh, building a system where definitely there can be no consistent interpretation uh, is what really makes it quite interesting as a, as a project. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then of course you also have the whole thing. What I, what I was saying about like identity in, in jazz uh, before as well, that you you hear me play guitar and perfectly sounds like me playing guitar, but uh, I'm not quite quite there, like physically, it's, it's a virtual agent that sounds like me. Mm. Um, but then, of course, and I mean, I mean, I could spell this out also for different groups where it's not necessarily me that is like virtualized. Um, you have personal relations, right, that are in the air because you have been working for together for a long time and you identify each other by how you sound, by what you do and so forth. And of course, this history is still up in the air, uh, even uh, if, if there's a virtual agent that just sounds like uh, some or several of those performers. Mm. And uh, I don't know, to, to, to me, that creates a lot of like specific layers, which maybe are, are unique to that kind of performance practice, which is so much based on getting familiar with specific people by how they sign how they sound and also by what they repeat all the time because i think in improvisation we repeat ourselves all the time but that's also part of it and i think it's great we do mm. yeah no it's a fascinating project um yeah so uh, it, it's really interesting to hear how how the light is being used as as yeah it seemed, it's being treated as a sound source and and Talking about the solar panels, you 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 talk about listening rather than vision. It's 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 really being treated as a sound source. And um, but I I yeah I, I wonder if you could sort of develop on on um, the visual aspect of that because um, so in Pasquet's piece uh, the lights are, are quite statically um, connected to. A, a sort of leading rhythm that's in the music and that and it, it's it's quite chaotic busy music with lots of little clicks and stuff and and i i i kind of understand that the lights in 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 that part in in that piece they kind of contribute to to being able to structure the audience's listening to this something that can be quite um busy and and, and difficult to to discern um i wonder how, how you sort of see uh, the lights, the visual aspects of the lights participating in 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 the way that they structure cybernetic listening and 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 the way the piece is perceived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it has a huge influence. Also, if you think about like you play or there's music going on and all of a sudden the light is off, right? It's very strong. Obviously, like just removing the light is such a strong choice for our perception and and anything else that it does absolutely is, is very uh it's a very strong um yeah choice in terms of like 
uh, how we uh, found or how yeah on what we found our acoustic um, uh, interpretation of of the sound or like how we how we listen to to the music. So uh, you know, in that sense, definitely like listening to the music is always like a multisensorial thing you don't just like listen with your ears and that's it everything else doesn't matter no everything matters everything is is part of it and so i think um that's very relevant to that um uh, but that's definitely a reason for why in in this piece i think it's very relevant that the light is is really an instrument and um i, I mean i i don't know the um uh, a piece that you're uh, referring to. I had a look into Oliver's work and I was really amazed by it. And uh, thanks so much for bringing that up to me. I, I, I thought it was really incredible. Um, but I do think that there's definitely, uh, you can see a lot of uh, um, works, maybe also more in the electronic music club scene, where light is sort of like sidechained to music in some way. Um, but it's sort of like used to emphasize um, the interpretation, let's say, of, of, of a certain piece of music. And I think uh, here it's very important that the light is really independent. Hmm. Uh, there is no side chaining involved or whatsoever. Uh, it's really an instrument that plays by itself and it has a sonic element as well as a visual element. And um, uh, that's that's very relevant because, for example, let's say uh, I could be playing a phrase. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and you might have a light pulse that goes like pop, 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 or you have something that goes like and you hear that light and you he see it at the same time and you can imagine what i did musically would be completely different in how i how i listened to that and and i think that's uh, and at the same time of course i'm also listening to the light and mm -hmm. i think that's very very relevant for for that kind of kind of play to really also let's say uh work with the the different kinds and different layers of of agency that are involved in in, in this yeah definitely and as your guitar um you know has has the acoustic uh sounding element to it but it's also a visual thing that's uh, that, that people are going to see and that will have will impart agency it's uh, yeah it's mm -hmm. just yeah i suppose you have a tendency with the lights as to because it's so visually striking that the, the, that that kind of that can sort of weigh on your perception. But yeah, yeah, it's like with any instrument, there's a the, it participates in in a in a much larger kind of network that that drives our perception of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talked about a solo project and uh, talked about a duo. Um, perhaps uh, we could talk about um, another project that sees. Uh, a, a wider range of actors. Um, so I found it really fascinating uh, to read about um, the human robotic ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, so this project sees an interaction between human and robotic musicians. Uh, I wonder for those who, who haven't um, seen it, if you could uh, explain a bit how the, how the project works. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so this project um, works with four human musicians, uh, with uh, Sebastian Grams uh, on double bass, Lotte Anker on saxophone, Philip Zubeck on prepared grand piano, and then myself on guitar. And we have uh, four uh, robotic instruments or four robots. Um, one is a heliophone, um, uh, the other one is um, a tubular bell robot called Tubo. Uh, there's a third one that is a percussion robot, so it's 45 or something cowbells. It's just a massive amount of cowbells in different sizes. And um, the, the fourth one is a prepared uh, disc clavier. Um, and so the first three of these robots have been built by Gottfried Wilhelm Haas. Uh, he uh, runs the so-called Lovers Foundation uh, in Ghent, in Belgium. 
and they have a whole orchestra of robots and um of course they've been around quite a bit and i'm certain you know other people that also work with their robots and they're definitely collaborating a lot with like different composers um yeah and uh so in this uh, uh project um really uh my interest was to see like how can this group really become an octet in which um we have eight musical actors that all know how to take space and also how to give space um right and i i think it's very relevant also like for settings where uh, like human performance perform together and certainly the more players there are if like some players like never stop or if they don't know how to make a statement it gets very difficult and so i i think um that was sort of for me um that was really where i wanted to to get to like to to a system in which uh, I I'm not predefining any like scenes or so. So there's no predefined scenes. It's really open improvisation. Um, it is possible to um, yeah, have a have an uh, octet that really is capable of, of performing together in a yeah, transparent musical manner and that would i don't know give like space to different uh um performers to shine at different points and to yeah you know, to, to to play together and bring out those like different strengths in in the musical material yeah um and so so you're you were the you were behind the software for that project yeah um so defining the systems um yeah. as you as you described so i i i want I'm, I'm interested to hear about um how you approach working with other people um on a project like that um so obviously it's so there's a lot of improvisation but um how aware do you make people of of the system the nature of the system that you've put in place um what how would you describe the the rehearsal process um yeah I, was, I wonder if you could perhaps talk a bit about um your approach to bringing other people into these systems yeah. um well definitely um yeah it's it's a very interesting sort of process in itself already and it definitely made me realize that people relate to virtual agents quite differently if there is a physical form attached to them such as a robot mm uh uh versus if there's none uh because you have a physical object in space and you can sort of like uh identify what what they i don't know uh, do what they are how they sound because like whatever sort of like data i'm sending to these robots and uh, so they are controlled by midi data um they're still going to sound as they sound right so there is a very sort of like set um yeah space of possibilities that uh, of like sounds that can be generated by those robots and they're really optimized for exactly that um and uh yeah so definitely uh sitting together and uh, rehearsing it felt like okay we are sort of starting to like form a group and know like who's doing what what do they like to do how do we fit together so it's really like a a, a process that um uh is yeah quite different from having a, a like purely software um realized sort of virtual agents because you have um yes set forms of sonic possibilities and uh, physical corpses in space that are part of the project mm. in this project i was sort of using a similar approach um that i use in my uh, in my uh, solo performance but in this case it, you have four different virtual agents each of them train on one of the human musicians um sometimes i i would uh, it would also switch in between and then it's for example let's say a robot 
sort of trains back on itself. So there's different different options, but the starting point is really to say like, okay, we have four virtual agents, we have four human players. That's what we start with in order to generate material, and then like things might start to change around uh, as 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 the process goes on. And um, so, but of course, that part is uh, audio uh, analysis, audio synthesis. Then the problem is like, how do you make MIDI data from that? And I actually started to use like different audio to MIDI algorithms, such as, I, I don't know, like Fiddle, Analyzers, uh, Sigmund, uh, some uh, algorithms from uh, ZSA descriptors. Um, I use Transcribe, uh, a bunch of different algorithms, which um, especially with some of those set as a descriptors uh, and you're really uh, trying to, um, let's say, not only describe was uh, what the, um, what the, uh, let's say base pitch would be, but you describe, I don't know, 36 overtones all at the same time over the different FFT bins. Um, that can be very interesting if you send that to a monophonic instrument, because then all of a sudden, depending on how fast they can play uh, one note becomes like a splash of, of sound because it tries to realize all of them um so in in a sense you have the the audio analysis and audio synthesis part you have an audio to midi translation part where i would claim like all those different audio to midi algorithms have their own sound and if for example you uh, just to build a feedback system with them, you see they set on like very different sorts of frequencies. So you can really tune them and really play with like how they interpret sound. Or then if you uh, are not only doing a monophonic, but a polyphonic interpretation, for example, based on the overtone spectrum, then things, yeah, it's also quite different or with transcribe really uh, being maybe more, um, uh, how to say, like truthful to notes that are actually played and not only to like recreating the overtone spectrum. And then at the end, uh, um, you have the robot that every robot, depending on what you send this robot, is going to do different things. A, for like limitations of speed or like velocity or um, how fast it can yeah, repeat things. Or of course, also like, let's say uh, you play some chords and you send that to a percussion robot. You're not going to hear those chords, as, uh, or not as such, at least. Uh, but um, yeah, so that's sort of the orchestration part that is at the end of it. And I think all those uh, things are, are very important to, to consider for the whole thing to work in the end. Mm -hmm. And um, also here, I think, so may, maybe that's a, that's a relevant thing to say, like, I, I think the really interesting part of uh, like working with uh, these sorts of like uh, simple machine learning uh, applications uh, is that you, I think, can have a different access to, let's say, the musical material and the musical form forms that uh, human players would create without necessarily having to algorithmatize them or to transcribe them or something like that, right? I mean, I could sort of, let, let's say, choose the, the classic algorithmic approach to, uh, to, to describe forms or to describe possible, I don't know, pitch classes or stuff like that um and cr let them uh, sort of like generatively create variations upon each other uh, using i don't know diff different approaches from like very old ones like markov chains to like maybe more contemporary ones um but i i think i'm very interested in seeing like okay how can a, um how can i um yeah, use the existing musical language uh, that human performers already come with. And in this case, really focus on the timbral shape. 
because of course with an MFCC anal analysis, what what you get is a is a very good like distinction of timbre. And I think that's super relevant in at least the kind of improvised music that I play. Uh, that really distinguishing different kinds of sound, different kinds of timbre is super relevant. And and uh, so that's why this is sort of let's say at the, at the at the center of the interpretation mechanism. Uh, I, I think it's super relevant mm. uh, is to deal with timbre. Um, yeah, and in this. Uh, robot project now the, the the next interesting problem is like okay well you can do that but if you then sort of have this like audio to midi interpretation and you send it to a robot that again only understands midi there's a different kind of bucket that you need to pass through in order for for something to come out that matches the sort of timbre music that was at the start of it and uh to me that turned out to be a very interesting problem in in this kind of uh setting mm. yeah no it's really interesting it's really interesting to hear you um how you approached working with with robots in, in that mm. way because because yeah they are quite a they're quite a bespoke kind of agent in 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 this kind of network yeah I mean, it brings to mind um the piece that rodrigo constanzo did for um for the Flucoma project um so he's a percussionist and and he he built uh using 3d printing he built his own little robots um that were fairly simple in comparison because they 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 would just tap one solenoid um little symbol with either a plastic or a wooden beater and so that was one state and another was whether they had um foil over the uh, over them or not but um yeah no it was really interesting to see that he built those robots and that they were physical objects that were placed around the audience when he could very well have of have, have been triggering samples of solenoids and and spatializing them around the space um but yeah it was a very kind of strong striking moment um in 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 uh, in his piece where the these robots that were around the audience suddenly started that were hidden as well that suddenly started making these noises and uh, mm -hmm. yeah it was quite a strong moment. I wonder yeah how 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 did you kind of anticipate and navigate the the audience's kind of um relationship with that kind of musical agent because you've talked a lot about the um the the performers relationships with those agents but I, was, I wonder how yeah if you could talk a bit more about the audience yeah uh, it's it's a very interesting um how to say like problem what you bring up with the uh with the solenoid robots uh that you mentioned and um let's say perceiving musical agency or like just maybe less than agency just perceiving that something happens or that something is done and um it was very interesting in this uh, specific piece for me to um see um and um, i'm sorry i'm using interesting in a very german way if we say interesting <laughs> it has no negative connotation <laughs> yes, yes, sorry <laughs> it's very German so Germans they say interesting and they really mean it's very interesting to them they don't it's not a pejorative term okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry no, no, so yeah. think about you know this uh, German uh, natives uh, um, thought or the, the the sort of thought that is given within the language sometimes it's hard to get out of the English uh, well, as I guess there's a lot of those uh, that uh, German people like to do interesting is one of those. Um, so it, it was very uh, like uh, fascinating for me to observe like what the audience sort of also wanted to to see and also partly how what is built into those robots. So um, a lot of those robots actually they have LEDs, not all, not all of them, but some that indicate when the robot is playing. And I think the reason for that is that, of course, if you have, I mean, all those, like, for example, let's say on the heliophone, you have like a solenoid construction that presses down the valves and stuff. Um, 
if the audience uh, sits far away, they cannot see that this is happening. So they need some other kind of indicator to see that the robot is doing something. Um, and I, I have the feeling that uh, it can be quite frustrating if people don't see that. Uh, which, of course, as a performer, you quickly forget about that because you know how those robots sound. So I don't need to see the robot in order to know what it is doing because I, I hear it and I know how it sounds. So I can always uh, yeah, just uh, understand it from, from listening to it. But I, I felt that like giving visual cues to the audience can be quite, quite important. And I, I think if I was to present this project again, I would certainly um, think about the visual cues more uh, mm. in, in order to, to, you know, in how you how you set up the robots, how, where do you position the audience in, in order to, uh, for the audience to have a chance to have more visual cues about who's doing what. Mm. Uh, and I mean, uh, 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 with human musicians, you always uh, know where they are, you can see them, you see what they do. And I, I have the feeling that one of the reasons why for a lot of people, improvised music can be so much harder to listen to on a CD than live is that you can see people and you can see how they communicate with each other, right? You, I mean, you're looking at each other, you're giving visual cues, you're doing mimics, it's so complex. It's much more than just the sound. And I think for a lot of uh, uh, people, if they're not like totally into into this like specific sonic language, it can be really hard to listen to it on a CD because all this other framework is is gone. And 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 in fact, also a lot of musicians that play this kind of music themselves uh, feel I don't know stronger about listening to it in concert than than on a recording. Of course, that's also a long argument from also like, should we record it at all? Because they, um, it's a process art form and not a work focused art form, la, 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 la. But I, I think on top of that, you can really see like how important visual cues are and with these robots that was very, uh, yeah, very um, uh, much present to me. Um, and I should say that actually I, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's, I think it's not on my website. So I, I did a line of like different uh, uh, other uh, solo projects um, in which I was starting to use video because I realized, oh, if I play duo with a virtual agent, well, I know what's going on. But for the audience, unless they are like super experts in this music, they don't know how to discern uh, who is who's playing. Uh, so I started actually uh, uh, using video and using the, the sort of like um, a video from concerts of me of like solo performances and only use the audio from those uh, solo performances and just like trigger the uh, video of the concert through the audio. So it's like the video is side chained to the audio. But you do that and you have a screen and you have a video projector. And uh, so I was uh, trying to like have me on one side and the virtual agent on the other side, like roughly the same size. I mean, sometimes it can be hard depending on what the footage is and the camera angles and stuff, but roughly. Um, and uh, that turned out to be uh, perceived quite differently because um, uh, then you are really giving uh, people a chance to to also um, uh, have a, a visual input at the same time, and it's sort of like easier to to listen to. Um, actually, for the for the links under the video, I will also have a have a link uh, to a project to to show that. Um, I I haven't done a, a live version of that yet, so that means with like live recorded video footage, I really wanna wanna do that. To have live recorded video footage to to be used, but I, I haven't gone down to doing that. Mm. But that was sort of you know, um, uh, it's related to this robot project because I realized like how important these visual cues are, and uh, I made the similar experience with this solo project. So at some point I thought like, ah, hey, maybe I should really include video in order to 
to uh, address that. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, I mean, we, we, we won't get into that discussion that you mentioned, but um, yeah, there's, it, it's obviously an important question. This, I, these ideas of, of 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 being in the space and and what the visual aspects are, are bringing to it um and uh, yeah it's this this robot project certainly seems to have have, have specifically shone a light on the, on those questions and it's uh, mm. and i use it in the very german term uh, german signification of yeah i think that's very interesting <laughs> so, <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, when I've been saying interesting across the podcast, I've also been using it in the uh, okay. in the <laughs> sense of the um, Maybe in the do people in the UK use interesting in that way as well? Because definitely in the US, oftentimes people told me like, "Man, you're using the word interesting really wrongly." <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I, I've always thought that the, the interesting. Was a good term to use about. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, uh, I'd love to talk a bit, um, if that's all right, about about the guitar, because mm -hmm. um, so obviously it's a really big part of your practice. Um, I'd, I wonder if 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 you'd like to perhaps talk about the instrument in itself um, and and kind of what what it is that draws you to exploring its its sonic potential and how far it can be stretched um i mean is it is it a a matter of happenstance that you learnt it when you were quite young and and have just kind of step kept with it or is there something really about the the instrument that really draws to you or is it a mix of both so it... hmm. um well uh, so I have actually been, uh, because over the last few years, I've been doing a lot of like also live performances with uh, Buchla synthesizers, which um, my theory is that although, of course, uh, Buchla, uh, at least as far as I know, was not a guitar player, but there's something really related to electric guitars uh, on in, in the way that Buchla synthesizers sound and how they work. Um, I've been also doing quite a bit of work with like search synthesizers, but I felt like, man, Buchla, there's something about it that I immediately understand as a guitar player. Um, and uh, doing work with those Buchla synthesizers has really, um, uh, how to say, uh, made me ref make, yeah, made me reflect differently about um, what playing guitar means to me and why it is uh, has a specific um relevance and um of course i've been uh, playing playing the guitar for very long and um i i feel like um that uh, sort of having this interface let's say because uh, to me very much the guitar is a modular interface um you immediately participate in so much history in a sense, and of course, that's true for any other instrument. And there is many instruments with a much longer uh, history than the electric guitar, obviously. Um, but as soon as it as that is there, it, to me, it feels like okay, you are sort of like uh, logging yourself into this collective history. That, despite um, uh, you know, still trying to do your own thing with it. Uh, you're you're sort of part of that history, and it's 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 everywhere from like how you hold the neck or like how you hold the pick. What sort of objects do you do you use? Um, that um, of course, I mean that's also present with uh, with software or with analog synthesizers as well. And you you couldn't <laughs> think of them much without like. Uh, the historical background, uh, like where, where would they be coming from? But there's something very emotional as a performer to me about uh, this history and that uh, interface and how I can relate to it. And the the other thing um, that almostly sounds like contradictive after all this talk about abstract tombral music is really the melodic aspect that it has, even in like tiny inflictions of like of that there there is something that i i don't know to me has a very um uh yeah i don't know has a very yeah, emotional 
connotation. And um, I don't know. I mean, my uh, uh, education in undergrad was as a jazz guitar player. And back then, I mean, I used to play like 150 or 200 concerts a year as a guitar player. And uh, that was really my, my life, being a guitar player. And the further I move away from it, I, I feel like um, uh, it's still, uh, I don't know, it's a very specific sort of thing in my in my practice and uh um yeah i don't know i i i think it's probably therefore it it still stays a sort of like central element although i think uh, everything else that i do around it uh uh is really trying to uh, put this in quite different frameworks and i find that very interesting to sort of also use the guitar as something to to look at from very different angles and really sort of use it as a as a gateway to to quite different things uh, while still having this sort of um, thing and um, yeah I don't know if you if uh, for example with uh, the tertiary pretensions uh, projects if I uh, did that with something else that's maybe um, I don't know, much more abstract as an instrument. I think there is something that um, it lacks because there is a tension between this sort of um, yeah, electroacoustic uh, listening system and this sort of like yeah body of an instrument that is there and, and that has all the all the history that is immediately attached to it. And I, I mean, of course, the same would be true if I was playing saxophone or piano or I don't know, clarinet, whatever. Um, mm. But I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's quite uh, interesting to it. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I, I wonder, I mean, perhaps not at all, but um, I wonder if there's any connection between the kind of mechanical workings of a guitar and, and the ideas that often kind of come with uh, using sort of effect chains and and that kind of modular way of thinking about music. I, I wonder if that kind of thinking had any influence on on your ideas of of wanting to explore sort of feedback processes and, and cybernetics. And I wonder if there's any link between the mechanical workings of of, of a guitar and and the objects that gravitate around it and your kind of aesthetic approach to mm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's different layers to that. So one thing is the, the, the observation that certainly with this biography of a jazz guitar player turned into an electronic musician, I'm <laughs> by far not alone. <laughs> so there must be something about the guitar and uh, <laughs> that uh, I don't know, it sort of affords itself uh, to that because, yeah, as I said before, I think as a as a guitar player, um, uh, the instrument is always uh, like modular with the electric guitar, right? There's the, the electric guitar is not just the thing you hold in your hand. It's the cables, it's the amp, it's the pedals, everything. It's uh, the you, you, the whole thing that you're doing is is, is so much more so much more than just the thing that you hold in your hands and i think maybe that leads a lot of people to like going further and explore electronic music from that experience but definitely i i can see that i'm not alone with with that sort of like biography mm -hmm. um yeah and i i think on the other hand definitely the um how to say I, I I think uh at least to me I try to really take the take the the music or the approach to music the approach to sound and also the approach to like physicality uh, of sound uh into into the realm of electronic music as well and um of course like this uh, like question like how I mean, how do you, let's say, embody electronic music uh, is a very old question. And there has been so many different approaches and like how how this can be done from like 
interactive uh, sensor based uh, stuff uh, controllers uh, i don't know like wearable instruments and so forth and so forth so i think it is a a quite uh, relevant question um but um yeah definitely for, for me this sort of aspect of of physicality and this experience um of it with the with the guitar and also a lot of yeah the the sonic sort of ideas and paradigms is is really really relevant to that mm. um yeah yeah well yeah that was certainly a question at, at many of the plenaries during the flucoma projects and stuff that um yeah a question that was thrown around is this idea of physicality in in electronic music and its importance and and people you know trying to get back to to physicalities that can be lost with kind of intangible processes and stuff like that and and certainly even like what what personally when i first started sort of dabbling in electronic music and stuff and you you have that kind of honeymoon period where you're doing all this kind of stuff in the computer and then yeah there, there does come a time where you're you do get that kind of yearning for for some kind of physicality and, and yeah for me one of the solutions was going back to one of my instruments uh, um with the bass with um it certainly brought it made a lot of sense um yeah mm -hmm. No, but it, it's it's always really interesting to hear someone who has such a ingrained and and you know this, this complex and long lasting relationship with a with an instrument and object like that talk about um, mm -hmm. talk about that that, that relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so perhaps um, a few broader questions to finish. Uh, so. Firstly, um, you're not only a musician, uh, you're also a professor of digital creation. Um, I'm always interested in hearing about uh, teachers' approaches to, to teaching these kinds of techniques um, and how you approach bringing people into the world of digital creation, of music and technology and, and more experimental musicking. So I, I wonder if um, there's anything you wanted to, to mm -hmm. discuss about that. Yeah. I. I... Well, I think it's it's a very relevant uh, question. Like, how do you engage people? And I think it's partly also seeing like what is the environment that you are dealing with. And um, in a sense, I find the German Musikhochschule systems they are quite um, yeah specific places in a sense, and it's quite different from, for example, the the sort of uh, situation that you would be in the, in Anglo-Saxon uh, institutions, oftentimes at least, because uh, they are more structured like a conservatorium. They're not uh, universities in the sense that they also have, I don't know, people from like uh, all those other strains of the sciences and the humanities. And so they're really art schools that focus on, on doing that. And um, I think that's uh, that's a good thing, but it's also a thing to like know and to address, and maybe also to find ways to to tweak it a little. Um, and uh, yeah, the way that I I approach it, because the, um, the mm, let's say I I think what, what what we are seeing now is that these institutions do recognize that electronic music and playing electronic music instruments are worthy of being included within the canon. So a worthy instrument is not just a clarinet or a piano or a violin or a double bass or whatever, but electronic music instruments are becoming relevant to the canon. And, uh, and I think that's quite a relevant step. And that's also quite different from uh, including electroacoustic composition within the canon and maybe have uh, synthesizers uh, like, uh, for example, uh, famously in Essen or in Cologne, which has an ARP 2500 from back in the day, or you have those uh, sort of synthesizers. And I think uh, of course, in the US, you also see this quite a lot, right? For example, I went to Columbia uh, for my PhD and we had the second Buchla 100 system ever built, just like standing around the next room, you have the 
the Mark II, uh, famously over there. So there's a lot of synthesizer history standing around. Um, but uh, um, as for the uh, German uh, uh, system, I think now we're getting to a point where we see like, okay, electronic music itself has become a musical culture that is relevant to the institution and that should be uh, included. And um, partly to me, that also uh, means um, now bringing back this term that I used before, including a kind of musical practice of electronic music that uh, in a sense also has a uh, um, yeah, it's astrological in, in how it works. And I think you could apply this uh, term also to things like Detroit techno, for example, or to techno altogether, or like how people, for example, relate to the sequences as like elements of music. So I, I think that the, the influence now, of course, this is sort of a broad, uh, 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 how do you say, like cultural uh, uh, thesis but i think the influence for example of jazz music on like contemporary like idm or so is is quite big and it's very relevant also to see that line and also to understand like how people that play with instruments and that improvise with instruments that deal with instruments as like agents and uh, also try to develop that uh, that those kinds of things find their place within the institution and um yeah so i'm the the way that i approach that is in, in a sense also yeah i don't know let's let's say uh, tr trying to to embrace a whole uh, sets of different practices from like people that build their own instruments um to perform with them to people that really do electroacoustic composition or that do intermediate works also to like installation uh, for example, sound installations and so forth, because I, I, I think uh, those things in a, in a sense also form a continuum and it's quite relevant also to, to, to address that. And um, because I, I think you can also use the same sorts of like technical skills um, in like very different domains and of course reflect them dif upon them differently, but um, uh, it's definitely useful to, to be, be aware of, of of those possible connections and possible uh, applications. Um, yeah, and uh, I I think there's definitely quite an interest now in on the on the side of like uh, German uh, music universities to reflect sort of yeah this yeah I don't know realization of the importance of uh, electronic music and. On the other hand, um, the sort of in Germany long neglected importance of what people here would call digitization, digitalisierung, um, uh, which is a very relevant sort of backbone, I think, for why people create uh, situations like that where that can be taught. And uh, so in, in a sense, like uh, uh, music universities also need to embrace the 21st century and they do need to find a way of, of dealing with all those possibilities that, I mean, that also can include like, let's say telematic music performances, uh, intermedia performances, so many different things that are not necessarily part of the 19th century canon that is the very foundation of uh, what a music university is in Germany. Mm. Yeah, well, it's good, it's good to hear that things seem to be going in the right direction, at least in, in terms of that in Germany. I, th I think in, in France, um, it's probably quite a similar situation where there's obviously, you know, musicology and stuff. It's, it's very kind of, has a very ingrained um, cultural baggage and history and you know all that um but a bit, yeah no i think things are tending towards the right direction and so uh, yeah it's it's reassuring to hear that similar things are happening in germany as well yeah, yeah. yeah no and and you can definitely see uh, several schools doing that move now all at the same time so, um 
that positions like that are, are created. But I, I think it's interesting to see, um, like, for example, Nuremberg achieved a position um, in digital creation. Um, and uh, Cologne achieved a position in digital innovation, and now Lübeck has digital creation. Hmm. Uh, you see the pattern, uh, something with digital. Yes. Uh, but it's very interesting for, for, for me to see that, for example, also in Nuremberg, um, the person that was hired there, Sebastian Trump, uh, also deals with improvising computer systems, which um, in a, in a sense, um, like I, I think um, it, it has taken uh, institutions in Germany quite some time to come around, like appreciating uh, improvisation and also appreciating sort of, let's say, like a uh, agency of uh, like technological systems. And I think it's, it's great to see that that is sort of also, um, uh, yeah, arising. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, perhaps as a final question, uh, Nicola, um, uh, I'd love to hear about your plans for the future. Um, so what are the current projects that you're working on at the moment that you might want to talk about? And um, and perhaps generally, uh, how do you see your use of, of AI and machine listening and all that kind of stuff uh, developing over the next couple of years? Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a lot of projects that are um, sort of that happened over the last years. I just finished a recording project. So I actually went back to Belgium, to Ghent, um, and did a recording with 25 of these robots. And in this case, then only me as the only human performer in this, because I really wanted to be able to spend some time with that very concentrated setting. And um, yeah, that was uh, yeah definitely a possibility to also work on the orchestration question uh, quite differently than I was able to do before because with so many robots, then you can really start to think about like orchestration in, in a very specific way. And yeah, so that was great. And there's a bunch of projects that are being like mixed and mastered right now, and I really wanna wanna release. Um, very soon. Um, and uh, I, I think on the sort of like level of like how I would want to develop projects like this is really to, um, how to say, like to find different ways of like dealing with form in a similarly inductive manner. Um, so let's say, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very surprised oftentimes at like how if you use feedback in the right way, how you can generate musical form that is at least in, in the idiom that I work in is like surprisingly convincing. But still, um, uh, the focus is very much on timbre. And uh, of course, there are yeah different approaches in music information retrieval to do that. And there's definitely approaches also to do, let's say, a uh, uh, description of um, behavior. Uh, a nice example of, of that might be uh, Dicey 2, which I don't know if you have seen it. It's a, it's a sort of like application that was released for Mubu recently by, by IRCAM um, to deal with, uh, uh, let's say a more complex behavior description that happens on an extra server that is run. Um, but I still think that like really dealing with with form in in musical improvisation is a very interesting problem, which I think by now I at, at least for me, I feel like I spent more time thinking about how to make machines relate to timbre than to relate to form or on uh, maybe on the other hand to also to re relate to like different contexts that are being referenced so i'm i'm definitely hoping to do more work on that and like get a more complex behavior on on on, on that layer um yeah and also to i don't know i mean there's a bunch of 
of projects that I've uh, done, like for example, with uh, I can also drop you the links with Tomomi Adachi. We did a, a project in which he was playing uh, with an artificial agent that is trained on his voice, while I play with the artificial version that's uh, 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 artificial agent that's trained on my guitar, and then it's a quartet between uh, uh, the four of us. Um, or I also did a, a project, for example, with. Uh, a dancer, Ingo Rolicke, Simon Rose, a saxophone player, and then Federico Fisi, who also does a work in machine learning uh, agent systems, um, that was actually using uh, a Mayo band uh, to have the dancer control a virtual version of the saxophone players playing while uh, I was playing with my uh, virtual player as well. And um, I'm definitely very interested in, in exploring this more, like, you know, what happens also in settings like this, where there's a lot of like history between persons around um, what happens if we substitute or um, not substitute or double up or like completely replace uh, performers with like virtual agents and what kind of like changes do occur to the social continuum that exists already. So I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done in that uh, main as well. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, definitely, um, yeah, I don't know, exploring some yeah, different like social constellations in this in this field. I, I think it's a very interesting project that I want to um, develop more or also work with systems that, for example, learn the vocabulary of like different performers over time and what you get is a whole community of performers. I think there's a lot uh, of possible projects that I, I want to explore in this like specific alley of like uh, human machine um, improvisation. Um, yeah, and I guess there's also a lot of other things that I do with like um, wearable stuff and things, but that's uh, really a whole other strain, but for the uh, uh, human machine improvisation part, yeah, I, I, I think that's sort of like where things are at the moment. Cool. Well, yeah, well, we'll be looking out eagerly for, for developments that will be coming. And uh, it also serves as quite a nice uh, uh, kind of shout forward to the next uh, po uh episode of the podcast because uh although i won't say who actually because uh, it hasn't been completely confirmed yet but one of the people that you talked about will probably be appearing on the on the podcast so uh, ah, fantastic <laughs> yeah <laughs> i will find out <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah so uh as i've said uh everything that we've been talking about today will be um will be uh linked to uh beneath this video uh where it lives on the flucoma learn platform um and there'll be a link to that um underneath the youtube comment where uh the youtube um description where this video will be and uh we're also now um on uh audio only um podcast streams uh so various um outlets that this will be on but um all the links uh, that will be readily findable for people who um who would like to learn more about the things that we've been discussing today um so nicola thank you so much for talking with me it's been really fascinating really interesting in the german sense of the word <laughs> and uh yeah no it's been a pleasure having you on um thank you so much for your time yeah thank you so much for your time jacob it has been really fantastic and yeah thanks so much again for the invitation and uh yeah looking forward to further exchange in the future great i'll see you again soon yeah all right